I'd like you all to take a moment and envision your first school dance. Most likely, it was a middle school dance. Brace yourself. This might be the most awkward invention of our civilization. You all know it, and what you usually have is a sort of vast no man's land, and planted on either side the opposing camps, the girls and the boys. These are humans behaving like plants, absolutely immobile. And this is what plants face with regards to romance. No man's land, a romantic destination, and no ability to move. Well, I love plants. I love them. They are fascinating. I love that they must do what all living things must do, but with that one big difference, they cannot move. They are forever at that middle school dance, but it looks a little bit more like this. So how do you solve the basic problems of life? Survival, finding a mate, and getting your babies out into the world if you can't move. I've devoted my research to the second question, that of plant sex. So funny. <laughs> so let's start with a little plant sex ed 101, right? First of all, plants are sexual, very sexual. This is often an overlooked fact. Most flowering plants have both male and female reproductive parts, and they combine sperms and egg to make a baby, a seed. Now, that means pollen is just sperm and water because sperm must stay wet to be viable, always, packaged up for light travel. And there's a lot of variation in this next step, but essentially, the pollen lands on the stigma, which is the female part. And the stigma, well, she must be wet and slick and sticky in order to receive pollen. The pollen grows a tube down to the ovary where the egg awaits. Sperm hits egg, success. I have students in botany who, once they've had the class, despair at ever being able to give their grandmother Easter lilies again. <laughs> because, of course, it's like saying, here, Grandma, have a lovely bouquet of plant vaginas. It's horrible. But remember, these sexual plants cannot move. They can't just trot across that dance floor and give their pollen to a likely candidate. And this immobility is a huge deal. And it's led to this involved, complex relationship with pollinators who broker the deal. Flowering plants rose to world dominance with this neat trick of using pollinators. Over millions of years, they evolved seductive colors, seductive shapes, scent, monogamy, polygamy, sexual deception, sexual mimicry, all coming back to this one fact, that boy flower cannot walk over to girl flower and must use a pollinator. So when you talk about evolution of any kind, you have to have a Darwin slide. It's the rule. And when you have your Darwin slide, you have two options. You have young Darwin and you have old Darwin. I myself like to go with Foxy Darwin. I mean, he, he's almost working those lamb chops, but he isn't. Regardless, Darwin was interested in plant sex and the evolution of plant sex. And he was really the first scientist to take botany and pollination biology from being just a pastime of gentlemen scholars in tall hats and really make it a hypothesis-driven discipline. So for instance, he studied the Angricum orchid, and he predicted that this flower, with its beautiful long 30 millimeter spur hanging down the back with nectar at the bottom, must have a pollinator to match it that could reach that nectar. Now it took almost 70 years, but lo and behold, such a pollinator was found. This sphinx moth with this impressive long and most important, predicted tongue. So it is possible to look at a plant and predict who pollinates it. And there are some very charismatic examples of this. This is my very favorite. The Ophirus orchid looks and smells like a female wasp in heat. Any guesses on the pollinator? It would be a male wasp. 
uh, to be accurate, a sexually frustrated male wasp. Doesn't get what he wants. This Rafflesia, this giant flower, looks and horrifically smells like a rotting carcass. Uh, and it's not surprisingly pollinated by flies. Look at the size of that stinky beast. Plant love comes in so many styles. <laughs> so the idea that you can look at a flower and its traits and predict who pollinates it, these are called pollination syndromes. And botanists became very comfortable using these as hypotheses. And there's seven basic ones. And so for instance, if you are red and you dangle and you have a lot of nectar, you are a bird plant. That's your syndrome. And if you are white and you open at night and you smell of either sweat socks or marzipan, you are pollinated by moths. You are a moth plant. And these syndromes were used extensively for a long time. They still are today. And so when you look at these, humans love to look at patterns and then make predictions. But the natural world is a hot mess of cautionary tales for when we overreach in those assumptions. It makes such a nice, tidy narrative. The idea of one plant for one pollinator, a coupled, tight relationship. But the reality is plants are very promiscuous. So the question I had was, my research question, how accurate are pollination syndromes? How good are they at predicting who pollinates you based on your traits? So the group of flowers that I study are the Enothera, the evening primrose family. And they are hawk moth syndrome. These are hawk moths, these big, fuzzy, awesome pollinators. They move so fast. But the Enothera also have a lot of diversity, and not only in what they look like, but also in their pollination systems. Yes, they are hawk moth pollinated, but some are moth, bird, bee, butterfly, even ant lions. So this is a great system for me to look at the issue of pollination syndromes. And I studied 54 of these flower species in pursuit of that question. So what my team and I did is we traveled the US tracking their pollination systems. And what you do is you spend hours watching the plants and you record who visits, who pollinates, who touches that stigma. And then you collect those pollinators and you scrape the pollen off them. And you make a lot of slides and you count and identify every single pollen grain. And then you grab that stigma, that wet and sticky female part, and you scrape the pollen off of that, and you count and identify all of that pollen. And I hope right now you're thinking, who on earth does that with their time? Let me, let me give you a little insight to me. So my first science experiment was not a success. I was six. And my father had been reading to me in the children's encyclopedia about old earth and dinosaurs and deep time. And I got it into my head that it would be a really great experiment and kind of profitable to make oil. It didn't seem hard. I had an old checklist. Heat, time, pressure, dead stuff. Great. So I got black walnut tree leaves and I smashed them between bricks and I set the whole mess out in the sun for a week, which is 100 million years to a six-year-old. <laughs> At the end of the week, I had made beautiful, dark oil. Excited, I went to my father, and he gently and lovingly broke the news to me that I had made beautiful, dark slime. Well, I was pretty devastated, but he was delighted because I had kept a little notebook and recorded every step and every observation the entire week and all my results. Where, he saw, where I saw failure, he saw the soul of a young scientist. And that is who I am today, more specifically a botanist. So that little girl grows up to do this. Observes 6,394 flowers and counts the pollen on 1,596 insects. That's called hard data. And when you collect hard data, you have a lot of adventures, whether you want to or not, out in the field. And I'm going to share with you just what one of those was like. So we were tracking the plant of the 54 called Enothera riparia. This grows in North Carolina along the banks of the ominously named Cape Fear River. And this is early June, which is alligator breeding season. Now, every local we encountered told us that only the very stupidest humans on the planet would be along the banks of the Cape Fear River in early June. 
So we were out there for weeks, because we're botanists. And we didn't see a single alligator, nothing. Saw plants, saw pollinators. And then the last day, I was along the banks, collecting the flowers, and I, I heard this very odd, high-pitched squealing noise from my undergraduate assistant, sort of just right behind me. But uh, I turned around, and about 15 feet from me in the water, there was bubbles and emerging reptile. And my little mammal brain freaked out. And you've never seen two people move so fast. We were back away from the edge of the water, over the fence, across the field, to the car, like lightning. Two things are very impressive about this, though. One, we still had our plants. Because we are botanists. <laughs> and second, I was seven months pregnant. Yeah. It's commitment. Okay. So I have hard boots on the ground data. I'm ready to answer my question. Is what you look like actually predict who pollinates you? To do that, I built a multivariate phenotypic space model. Now, hold with me. We're only going to super nerd out for about 10 seconds. What this means is that I took all of those syndromes, the possibilities of those, and coded them by trait and created this space. And then I did the same thing with my 54 Enothera, and I coded their traits and put them into that space, like this, so they'd see what cluster they came closest to. And the way you determine which uh, syndrome they lie closest to is by measuring what's called Euclidean distance R. And that's how you know which syndrome is what is predicted by you. So it's very simple. I have now plant, predicted pollinator based on my model, an actual pollinator based on my hard boots on the ground data. So how accurate are pollination syndromes at predicting pollinators? Terrible. I mean, really, really bad. 48% of the time, you might as well flip a coin. It's awful. Well, that doesn't mean they don't exist. Pollination syndromes are broad patterns, good for discussing over time, millions of years, patterns of co convergent evolution and broader patterns for developing hypotheses. What they're really bad for is predicting specifics. Now, if you think about it, there is no substitute or shortcut for getting real answers with real data. Real answers with real data, that's true for almost everything. So this research has a little moral to the story, a universal lesson. Okay, so why do we care? Why do we care about plant sex, other than it's kind of fun to scandalize people with? Or why do we care about being able to predict pollinators? Because plants can't move. And as more habitat is lost, as our climate changes, as our world alters, that plant-pollinator relationship becomes broken, fractured, uncoupled, and we face serious consequences. 85% of flowering plants, and that's a conservative number, must have a pollinator to set seed. For our species specifically, over 100 of our crop plants must have a pollinator. Without pollinators, we go hungry, and we cannot do what pollinators do. Perhaps most serious, no pollinators, no chocolate. <laughs> to raise awareness on the role of pollinators for our food system, Whole Foods Market here in St. Louis did an interesting sort of display piece in which they pulled from their shelves all of the produce that would require a pollinator. And the before and after photos are really quite striking. 52% of what we eat disappears from the shelves. Gives you a little bit of pause. So plants, pollinators, and people. This is a love story. It's a relationship that involves all three groups. Plants will always need their pollinators, unlike those middle schoolers who will grow up and finally move and find love. Plants will never be able to do that. They must have their pollinators. They need them. And we need that relationship to persist. We need a diversity of native pollinators to buffer against loss in our changing world. And the pollinators need our conservation efforts. Now, many a conservation effort is so overwhelming and dark. 
when it comes to save the polar bears or the tigers or the rainforest. These are complex issues involving international law, huge land areas, really overwhelming. But pollinators are small, with small needs, mighty, but small. And you and I can do something to help them today. Plant natives in your yards and native flowers in corner lots and at the edges of crop fields. This provides food and refuge for pollinators. It is as simple as going to pollinator.org, type in your zip code, gives you a whole list of plants and all the details. Your yard full of native plants could be just the island oasis that a tired pollinator needs. Make bee homes. Get a block of wood, drill holes, stick it in your yard. This gives them a place to overwinter. Small actions make a difference when it comes to helping pollinators. Plants, pollinators, and people, this interrelated love story. They need our conservation efforts. We need what they can do for this world and for us. To survive and reproduce, that is called evolutionary success. And we, the living world, must have each other to succeed. Thank you.